The following is a production of Ninja Penguin Podcasts. This is Christy. And Chris. From Chris's on Infinite Earths. And you're listening to Play Comics. And welcome to Play Comics, a show where we look at video games based on comic properties and how well they stick to that source material. As always, I'm Chris, and today I'm joined by Drew from Real Feels Podcast. Drew, how are you today? You know what? I'm doing pretty great. In, enjoying this, uh, you know, rather rather nice weather on a, on a lovely weekend afternoon. Getting ready to talk some Judge Dredd. I mean, really, how much more of a better day do you need? man if if there could be no work tomorrow and i could just like ride this cheese coaster out it'd be perfect i'm right there with you on that i'd say the judgment is clear no work tomorrow <laughs> in case you didn't pick up on it today we're talking about judge dread primarily for genesis and super nintendo and this one is based on the movie which is part of why i got drew on here because Real Feels is a really good movie podcast. Thank you. So the Judge Dredd movie, I hadn't watched it till yesterday. And I think yesterday was probably my, maybe like my fifth or sixth time watching it since, you know, since 1995 when it first came out. And I, I was super excited that you actually got to have the experience of watching it for the first time. You, you have fresh eyes fresh experiences for this i have nostalgic flair it's amazing how looking at the movies as a 30 year old person for the first time is different from seeing it as like an eight-year-old person right i mean taking a look at it where yeah like i would have been nine maybe ten uh if i if i didn't see it directly like in 1995 i mean it's not overtly violent so it's 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 even tame considered for like today's standards, obviously. And it it just has a a bit of freshness for the comedic value where it's just like quippy and like corny one liners. And of course, as the audience can have a collective groan, it has Rob Schneider in the film side by side with Sylvester Stallone. But it it works. You need with all the macho man like attitude that Sylvester Stallone can you know cram into his tight little you know police leotard with the golden uh, crotch piece, you need Rob Schneider to sit there and make little faces, do his whole little like <laughs> kind of laugh. I, it's just it, it's a good combination for this film which was meant to be a lot darker than it originally was. And honestly, like for the practical effects in the film, alongside with the CGI, it works out beautifully. I mean, those practical effects are one of the things I really loved about it. Cause you know, the giant robot in there, that's an actual animatronic robot. Right. They wanted to put a man in a suit, but the director, Danny Cannon was like, Nope, Nope. Let's build this thing. I want this thing to actually be built. So they, they, they had a guy in a ro- in a uh, <clears throat> not it's almost like a robot suit that basically would mimic kind of like the hand motions, but then you also had five other people manning controls to make it like stand up, you know, bob the head, swing the arm. I mean, it it was this huge thing where it literally also had like forklift kind of like ability, like the power. So the scene where you have uh, Diane Lane being held by the neck, like they they had to be really careful about that because if something were to like malfunction or anything, I mean it could it could have actually hurt her. So I mean it was it was fantastic to see the idea of the actual like ABC robot 
come to life. That that was a real neat thing. And really, all those movies before they started CGI and everything, I love going back and watching those because they just don't look so fake. This oh, is clearly yeah. in that era. Right. So, I mean, like the like the chase scene with the lawmakers where they had to, like, fly around the city on the uh, the police motorbikes, that, the original one, totally practical effects, and then they came back in and filmed them on a green screen. And But, I mean... It's just super fun to watch everything. Like they built the motorbikes from scratch, the ones that are going around the city, where the actual motorbike itself was too powerful for Stallone or even Diane Lane to be riding around on by themselves. So professional stuntmen actually had to ride the real ones. And they got like ones with training wheels, essentially, like less powerful models. It's still super cool, if you ask me. Oh no, 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 no! There is no doubt that it was still super cool. I mean, I just think it's, I just think it's neat that it actually went this far. I mean, granted, it it didn't do well in the theaters. You have like a seventy million dollar budget for the film, where it had a U.S. gross of thirty four point six, essentially. But then finally, for a worldwide gross, it did make its money back with one hundred and thirteen million. So. It had to go everywhere else where, I mean, like Stallone is going to like, you know, kind of rake in the cash and basically kind of not necessarily like ride the coattails of Rocky, but it's definitely going to draw the crowd. And Stallone being in there, I think, is really the first super interesting part of why this movie gets away from the comics, just because they wanted to make sure people saw Stallone in there. I mean, if you look at the comics, Dredd doesn't take his mask off. No. I mean, none of the judges really do, but Dredd really doesn't. Yeah, it's it's something actually, like, really kind of important for the fact that he does eventually reveal himself after he takes off his helmet, which, like we were talking about earlier, I mean, it, it must have been this great shock for fans of the comic book when he takes off his helmet and reveals that this is his face. It's It's like those masterful reveals where... Even in, like, we just recently did uh, Once Upon a Time in the West. And to have Henry Fonda come out of the shadows and reveal his, like, piercing blue eyes and as he's the villain. Like, that's the moment from the crowd. Same thing for when Stallone reveals his face, taking off the helmet. Because, I mean, for any other person that was, like, even offered the role, like, I know that Schwarzenegger was originally offered the role for Judge Dredd in the film. I, I wouldn't have wanted, I would not have wanted a uh, an Arnold uh, uh, judge. I don't think it would have actually had the same kind of impact. Yeah, I like that Stallone isn't overly huge. I think Arnold would have been too much. Arnold would have been, Arnold would have been too much for it originally. I mean, even when, what was it? I think it, I think it was Demolition Man, which again, Stallone, but Demolition Man was originally going to be offered to Arnold, but Arnold cost too much money at the time. So he was, he was still the big hype from Terminator and it was, it was, it was not going to happen. And I mean, nothing is better than Stallone, like yelling the lines while he comes up in the streets. He was all like, I am the law. These blocks are under arrest. It's like, no one on this earth can say a line where it looks like they've had a partial stroke and you're just going to completely fall in love and just be fascinated with the man every single time. I mean, I don't even think anybody can imitate a Stallone accent without having, like, again, the lower part of their face drooping while trying to imitate. It's, it's such a fun uh, casting choice. You know, and Rob Schneider in there, too. Another fun little choice. I mean, a complete surprise to me. Rob Schneider's role was actually originally offered to him from Stallone himself before... Um, the, the original role was offered to Joe Pesci, but Joe Pesci turned it down. And even at the time, I'm okay with that. Um, I think if they would have uh, stuck more to the uh, to the comics... 
uh, because Fergie in the comic books, like he's the leader of like the everyman. He is the leader of like the gangs that are happening in Mega City. So having Joe Pesci in that role, cool. I could have totally seen Joe Pesci doing that. Joe Pesci could have been like the tough guy, like leading everybody and then eventually like siding up with Dread. To have Rob Schneider do it, it's laughable. It, I mean, he doesn't seem like he's going to be a a big help in any way. He's he's the bumbling idiot. And it's it just it provides a good sort of comic relief. He has like stupid one-liners. Like when they finally make their way back into the Hall of Justice and they're trying to, you know, get a disguise and they knocked out a judge and then Stallone's trying to like take, you know, the officer's uniform. And then, you know, Fergie Schneider's is all like, why are you taking his clothes off? We don't have time for this. And he just stops and pans his face up to Schneider and he's all like, are you serious? This is a disguise. <laughs> it, it's a... It's almost like a bumbling Mr. Magoo where he's being helpful, but he's not necessarily being helpful until the actual right moment. I mean, hell, his his hacking skills don't even come into play until the end of the movie. And even at the end of the movie, after he's been shot and he's being hauling, hauled away to an ambulance, he's still mugging for the camera. But it's just it's just one of those things. I don't know. I th I think it's a funny it's a funny choice. Sylvester Stallone personally made it. And better yet, for like fun little fact uh, factoid, Rob Schneider on the very first day of filming fell down a flight of stairs <laughs> and injured himself on the first day of film. And so, and Stallone was even telling him like, you know, comedy is easy to do, you know, action. Now that's tough. <laughs> now I went into this movie. I hadn't really looked at the comics much, and. All I had heard about the movie was it's horrible and Stallone never wears his helmet. So I was going into this just expecting a dumb 90s action movie and for him to at some point in the first five or ten minutes like, oh, I can't see through my visor and rip his helmet off and throw it away and never see it again. Right. Or like a bullet hits it and luckily like the visor part is bulletproof and then it's cracked and he can't see. So, yeah, let's. Let's get rid of the helmet. Maybe a little bit of blood is, you know, coming down the uh, over the eye. But no, it's it's for him to come right before um, Max uh, Max von Skydo, who plays Judge Fargo, and it, it, it's almost like taking off the helmet to look a man in the eye. You know, the same the same way like knights would do in the old days. They would they would march up. They take off their helmets as a sign of respect, and also to like you know pay respect. Uh, so it. It made sense for how and why he took off the helmet. But again, just a, a complete left field thing from the comic books itself. Uh, but it worked and you kind of needed to see his face. I mean, it's very, very different from the 2012 remake where he, he really doesn't take off his helmet. Uh, I, th I, I If I remember correctly in the in the remake, he doesn't take off his helmet at all. But luckily, this one, we get Stallone. Yeah, I haven't seen the new one yet, so I can't speak to that. But for anybody who hasn't seen Judge Dredd or doesn't really know what it is, they're living in a future world. And, I mean, the first thing that caught my eye was that opening crawl of global warming and crazy politicians and everything. And I'm sitting there like, I thought this was supposed to be a fictional movie. I thought this was supposed to be. <laughs> narrated by James Earl Jones, basically, you know, almost predicting the idea of like how our world actually is. It, the, the world that they're living in almost looks like, you know, if like the fifth element Blade Runner and Priest like got, you know, mixed into a blender and then basically, you know, baked off at 350 for, you know, an hour and a half. I mean, and that's literally what they're like crapping out. But I do like the idea that, you know, when Rob Schneider's coming back into the city and he's being released from prison after like a six month sentence, he's like, oh, we're going to Heavenly Haven. And the they it's almost like in uh, Fifth Element where they keep going lower and lower and lower and lower into the city. 
And <laughs> Rob Schneider's like, oh, there it is. He sees this really nice hotel. That's my place. That's Heavenly Haven. And people, <laughs> the driver of the taxi is like, yeah, you wish. That's not Heavenly Haven. <laughs> and they go lower and lower to the depths of the city where a citizen riot is taking place and they're let out they're let off and you can see now it is like the slums it's new york apparently a city that has been made to fit 20 million people but there's 60 million in the city so everybody's overcrowded it's dirty it's not the future that apparently we've been promised <laughs> No, and they're living in a world where these judges completely skip the judicial process. They go around, they arrest people, they try them right there. I'd say at least 99% of the time find them guilty and pass their judgment right away. Yeah, and and depending on what that sentence is, it, it could very well be death. I mean, I, I love the fact that Stallone's character of Dread has basically the law book memorized. And he, you know, he tells Mob he's all like, you know, un- unlawful, you know, firing of a of a weapon in the streets. You know, that's, you know, two months. Uh illegal ammunition, you know, being held here and the, you know, for the assault on the on the people of the city, two years. And then they had just killed like a rookie judge. And the guy who's even in his face, he's all like. And now, the unlawful execution of a street judge. And the guy's like, let me guess, life. And he turns around and just shoots him in the head. And he's like, death, court's adjourned. I mean, I wouldn't say he enjoys it, but he definitely enjoys his job. Oh, yeah. Well, actually, I mean, I think he does enjoy being a judge. Because, I mean, even at the end, when they offer him the position of chief justice, he... He's walking away. He's like, I'm I'm a street judge. And I am very late for work. I mean, he he does enjoy going about being on his bike. He uh he loves getting in there. I mean, he he almost enjoys the fact because he has that one little uh tagline that he always has as he's going through the movie. And he he always says the whole like, I knew you'd say that. Because apparently. He has seen it all. He's done it all. And he's he's just ready to bring justice to everywhere. So, like, a real quick recap of the movie. Um, Dredd goes in there, goes down into that riot, gets some people, goes back, and they decide at the Academy that he needs to go teach some people how to be judges. I mean, really, who else better to do it? Right. And he thinks he's all like, oh, cool. I can get here two days a week. Uh, What am I going to what am I going to teach him? You know, uh, writing the uh, the lawmaker target practice, essentially. And, you know, Judge Fargo's like ethics. You're going to teach ethics. And he's like, oh, (laughs) because he had just he had just before that had been uh, questioned like you had 12 executions and death sentences. And he's like were each of them necessary and he's like unavoidable so i mean to him he like you're right like i don't know if it's an if it's like maybe a mixture of how comfortable he is in the job or even the the pure joy of being a judge like he's passing death sentences out left and right and he's all like yeah you're right yeah you know i no, no no every single one of them completely unavoidable all death and it's just so completely black and white by the book. Like, Rob Schneider's character just gets caught up in the wrong place in the wrong time trying to right. get out. And his quote-unquote friend, Judge Hershey, sitting there telling Dredd, you know, have some compassion, extenuating circumstances, look at what's going on. And Dredd's just, no, he broke the law. Right. It's like, I mean, this is not... Sorry, There's there's no... There's no excuse for your behavior. He hid inside basically like a food truck robot that goes up and down the halls of the apartment complex, like selling food. So he gets charged with tampering with, you know, city property, which is an automatic, like, five-month sentence. But since he had only just gotten out of prison and in less than 24 hours, he has habitually gone back to his old ways. It's now five years. 
because apparently he hasn't learned his lesson. And he said, I had to get away. I had to hide. They were killing people in there. And, he's, and, he's, and then, uh, gosh, wait, uh, uh, Dred was all like, you could have you gone out the window. And he said, 40 floors? That was suicide. And he's like, maybe, but it's legal. So whole- again, I mean, you're right. Like everything, everything is black and white to him. I mean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter even if uh, if Schneider was going to jump out the window and kill himself, as long as it was going to be legal for him. It it has to be black and white, because as we later find out, I mean, it's kind of how he was made and programmed. That black and whiteness really comes back to bite him in the butt too, because later somebody dresses up like him and uses his gun. Oh, we forgot to mention that. They're oh, gun- not even not even uses his gun. Not even his gun. But uh but a but a gun that tags the DNA of a judge every single time that it's fired. And somehow Judge Dredd's DNA ends up at a murder scene killing a reporter and his wife. And that's where, and like just slightly before that, we get introduced to Rico, played by uh, Armand Asante. And Rico apparently is Dred's brother, we find out later on down the line. But yeah, I guess it's uh, really weird at that point because all, all I knew looking at it was somehow Rico shot a gun and. All the evidence said it was Dredd. Right. And so you you later come to find out that Judge Dredd and Rico are apparently brothers. All right. They have been made from the exact same DNA that was taken from the original council of judges to make the perfect uh, judge, the perfect street judge, someone who is going to basically see the law as black and white, as as uh, Dread does, and I guess Rico got a bad batch, or his cloning did not go properly because Rico went unstable and crazy. And Stallone, as the character of Dread, had to judge his own brother, but unbeknownst to Dread, they were family. Because these fake backstories were made up for them. And Rico got sent off to the Aspen Penal Colony and kept in secret by Judge Griffin, played by uh, Jürgen uh, Prochnow, where I guess Judge Fargo thought that he had signed the death order for Rico and he didn't initially, uh, I guess it didn't get that far. And Rico has been kept alive in secret for the past, like, 20 years or something. And because they are made from the same DNA, Rico frames Dredd in this murder. And every single time that the bullet shot the lawmaker, the gun, it tags the DNA. So of course it's going to say that it's Dredd because they have the same freaking DNA. Despite the fact that they look nothing alike. But I'm, gonna have I'm not a DNA. scientist. I can't speak to that part. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the the only similarity, obviously, is the fact that they both say the word law in a very peculiar manner. <laughs> so, you know, in typical 90s action movie fashion, Dredd accepts his fate and decides he's going to just go to prison because as he is well established to Fergie many times... The law does not make mistakes. I think that's probably one of the funnier moments where he's on the plane. The only way that Schneider's character is able to identify Dredd, who's sitting next to him on this transport, he has to take his hand and put it up right above his eye level, Essentially, like, mimicking the helmet, the visor, covering half his face. And that's where he can only go, Dread? (laughs) He has to cover half the face up (laughs) to see a man who sits right next to him. That is the guy who arrested him earlier. And he even says, he's like, why are you here? He's all like, there was a mistake. Well, he said the law doesn't 
you know, make mistakes. He's like, yeah, you, 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 you should have. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they uh, now Dredd is literally on like a transport, probably filled with half the prisoners that he has already uh, passed judgment on, especially the one who tries to kill him uh, a couple of minutes later. Before the uh, transport is actually shot down by the legendary Angel family. That's such a weird, weird twist for the film as a whole. Despite a few other like plot holes in the actual like storyline. But to have a random cannibalistic family living out in like I guess they call the wastes. It's kind of weird how... Yeah, I wasn't expecting that at all. Right, and, and it's weird how you have Dredd's character say, the legendary Angel family. It's like, how would you know? How would you know who is out here? <laughs> you haven't taken the long walk. You haven't gone out into the waste. If, if we remember, like, you are a street judge. How would you possibly know... Like, who the legendary Angel family is, because I, I highly doubt anybody who has come across them survives to come back to Mega City and bring this story. <laughs> but it gives you a nice little, like, I guess, dystopian country hillbilly vibe. And the allowance of, like, technology. Again, like, if you're out in the waste, how are you maintaining your cyborg son? So Nothing about to, this future world function. surprises me. Surprises, yeah, surprises or even, you know, tends to make sense. <laughs> like, I just assumed that at some point electricity had been running out there and they got it hooked up again. Like, well, I mean, somewhere. a lot of the weird things of this movie to me are they're weird, but they're not so weird that I'm going to get hung up on them. No, 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 no. I, I think it's very easy to sit back and just have that lovely sense of like magical realism where you can just look and you're all like, why does that even make sense? Okay. It's the future. Okay. It's dystopian society. Why are they doing this? Oh, okay. It's out in the wastelands. Cool. All right. I mean, you just got to like, let it like rush over your head and just continue on with the story. Otherwise you're going to sit back and it's not going to make any sense. Because you're going to think about it way too hard instead of rather just, I mean, for a lack of a better way to put it, like blindly accepting it. But just sit back, smile and nod, enjoy the cheese. And just, just watch Sylvester Stallone shoot things up. That's what makes it entertaining. And it's only the fact an that you shouldn't have. Half. Right. It's only oh, beautifully timed. Only, you know, 90 minutes. You shouldn't have to think too hard. All you got to do is just watch Sylvester Stallone shoot people. And just smile and nod. That's all you got to do. It's not, it's not a terribly hard thing to ask. So like we said before, um, he comes back. Rico gets taken care of. Everybody lives happily ever after in a dystopian future. And Dredd gets to go be a street judge again. I mean, <laughs> even for a 90-minute movie, we could totally gloss over a lot of stuff. But it's right. just, it's a fun watch. I know originally we were going to get Nathan on here with us. Did he ever watch it? I don't think he ever watched it. No, I'm going to say no. He hasn't. He did not. He did not get around to watching it. So here's my challenge to Nathan. I want you to go watch the movie. Since apparently you've never watched it and I don't like that. I could be wrong. I, he, he could have watched it, but I believe the last time I asked him, he had said that he had never watched it. So yeah, I will definitely. Oh, I'm I'm gonna pass that along to Nathan. That is his challenge, and and I know he, that he has access to it. So, well, I mean, I got it on Amazon for three dollars. Oh, that's Just yeah. He he can he can afford that. I think I got it because I subscribed to. Was it like Stars or it was on Cinemax? Either one, like. So I I just grabbed it and watched it. I'm pretty sure you can even find like a clean enough copy on YouTube somewhere. Yeah, but either way, it's, it's I not doubt break that the they're gonna go through looking for this like they do for Disney animated stuff. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, any last thoughts before we take a break and look at the game? 
No, 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 no. Just, uh, I mean, maybe maybe obey the law. Avoid them judges. Yes, definitely obey the law. Obeying the law is good. <laughs> With that, we'll drop some promos for a few other shows and then come back and look at the game. It's a mum. Hello, mum. And a daughter. Hello, Stacey. Just telling it like they think they ought. I'd love to meet a pirate. Raft you off. <laughs> Raft you off. The melodic sound of the flute. <laughs> They'll make you pay your pants when you laugh. Wet and magazine. Funny chat. Comedy bronze. Sketchy facts. Dog monk. And advice from a very wonky cat. Kipper. <laughs> Raft you off. Sometimes sober. Raft you off. Cheese maggot. On Podbean and Apple Podcasts. It's not like they don't know what they're getting. If you like hilarious chat and poorly researched facts, then Rough Giraffe is for you. You can follow us on Twitter at Rough Giraffe Pod or find us on Facebook. You can download and subscribe to the show on your favourite podcatcher. I'm Megan. I'm RJ. And we host Oh No Lit Class, a comedy literature podcast that tells you all the strange and sexy facts you never knew about the books you had to read in school. Every episode is a fun foul mouthed spark notes for your ears filled with author bios plot summaries bad impressions and megan singing it's mostly you that sings no i sing well she sings poorly that's not true so come listen to us ruin classic literature one book at a time at onolitclass.com or wherever you get your podcasts oh no lit class we're for kids no we're not those were some great shows you should check out but first let's finish up with this one so, Drew, this game, I want to knock a couple things out real quick. There is a Game Boy version. There is a Game Gear version. They exist, and that's pretty much all we need to say. <laughs> oh, man, I miss having a Game Gear. I loved having a Game Gear as a kid. That thing never left my side. And I think the only thing I ever had for Game Boy was probably Pokemon. But Game Gear, I had a slew of games for it. Man, if I if I would have even known that this was a Game Gear game, I would have probably been like all set, ready for those car rides. See, I never had a Game Gear until I got to be an adult, and I still need to go change the capacitors on one of them, and I need to change out the batteries and the rechargeable battery pack that I've got, and then I might actually enjoy Game Gear stuff. <laughs> but I mean. Essentially, the Game Boy game and the Game Gear games are both ported down versions of what you get on Genesis and Super Nintendo. I can see that. So there's really no reason to talk about them. They exist. <laughs> like If you want to play it on Game Gear, you know what to expect. Same you thing with Game Boy. You know what you chose. You're in for it. You probably broke the law. <laughs> <laughs> Playing a Game Boy game with Judge Dredd. Five years. Super Nintendo and Genesis versions, though. I'm, it is a 90s movie tie-in. And mm-hmm. this is kind of back when you had some good ones, and then you had some really bad ones. And then you've got this that's... It, it's not horrible. It's just kind of there in a it's fun, but it's never going to be anybody's favorite game kind of way, you know, just probably something that you can just like, you know, grind on through and just kind of have it be like mind numbing entertainment, but nothing to say like, oh, my God, you should totally go out and buy this. It's more like, hey, I found it. I'm going to like sneak it home under the cover of darkness and play it and enjoy it. Yeah, like, I have the Genesis version and. Like, I only got it because I bought a lot of Genesis games out of the flea market, and it was in there. You know, I never would have chosen to buy this one by itself unless it was, like, a dollar. I do like in the Genesis game that they repeat the same scrolling text that James Earl Jones narrates in the film. Um, for the for the intro of the game. So, at least, I mean, it definitely shows, like, they're they're drawing and taking exactly from the movie. Aside from the fact, like... Though in the in the uh, Genesis game, he's uh like he throws grenades instead of actually like shoots them from the lawmaker. Yeah, that's weird. I don't know why they did that. I mean, unless they're actually just taking like the same game mechanics 
uh, who made? Uh, do you know who made the the uh, the Genesis game? Like what company? Like if it's the same company as like like Castlevania or something? Probe developed it and Acclaim published it. The Wikipedia page only has those names. Okay. So usually when they do that, it's the same people making it for every system. Okay. Yeah, because I'm just trying. I'm just trying to like watch the character like through a playthrough, where he's like throwing the grenades, and I'm thinking like, okay, I mean, does this remind me of any art style or any other games that like that same motion was kind of happening? But I mean, it looked neat. I mean, I can totally understand him taking the lawmaker and like firing at the enemies, and then they, you know, they blow up. Cool. I can totally see that happening. That's fine. Some of them where he, I don't know if he throws something at them, but it says like judged. And then this is what I would have really loved to have seen if Stallone actually left anyone alive that he judged, except for Rob Schneider, who's the only one that he judged and left alive, mind you. <clears throat> I didn't Where even the... realize that. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone else died. Uh, when, you, when he was judging people in the game, I guess, like, he, he would throw something. Like, I don't know if he's, like, throwing cuffs or something, but, like, they... They stand there, they, that, that little, like, word judged, stand, uh, like, lights up right above their heads. And then, like, a floating thing comes in, like, goes right under them and takes them away. How neat would it have been in the film to actually see, like, a stream of prisoners being, like, flown through the skyline, like, off to, like, a penal colony in the sky or something? Just like this... Just being taken away. You don't need the heavy transports. That actually could have done away with the uh, with the whole Angel family situation. See, that could have been so cool. Uh, jumping back for a second, games just from games that we've looked at on the show here. Probe has made Batman Forever and The Incredible Hulk. Hmm. And that's it as far as things that I've looked at already goes. Hmm. So it's like you know not super amazing games but not horrible and acclaim always puts out good stuff yeah. mostly as long as it's them and not ljn right but i mean it, it, it looks like a, a neat game it seems like it's following pretty much a stylized bit of the film i mean even despite the fact that like i mentioned earlier the 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 kicking of enemies that seem to uh catch fire and explode as well <laughs> yeah i mean somehow i guess his boots have bombs in them that blow up enemies but not him i don't know it's but weird. not him. but not him. <laughs> it's all i can think of i you know what again again i think this is more of those moments where you just have to like smile and nod and just accept it as it is don't question the video game. Don't question the movie too hard. You're not going to enjoy it if you do. And this is one of those games where you're kind of playing through the movie roughly. I think a lot of the roughness there is just because it's a 16-bit game and there's only so much you can do. Right, lots of lots of climbing, going down ladders, I guess destroying city property in order to get little power-ups and stuff which is weird because then he's breaking which is the weird law for, right i mean he clear he he arrested schneider for tampering of city property he in the game is destroying city property and i don't know how many bullets from a lawmaker a citizen can take because in the game i think you got to shoot him at least three or four times before they blow up dread has this lovely huge health bar i mean he took at least three bullets to the head and he was still up walking around so i mean it's got to be the armor i'm assuming but i don't know anybody who's going to take not a normal person especially in a city where people are probably starving and you know malnourished and there's pollution everywhere i don't know anybody who's going to take four bullets and probably still be walking yeah i mean they're really hitting up that recycled food hard if they're able to right. take that yeah the game is your basic 90s side scrolling beat 'em up action platformer game. I mean, it's not too remarkable. 
there, there's plenty of stuff recognizable from the movie, which is always cool. Right. I, I, I do like the idea of him basically climbing down through the layers of the city to basically like, you know, scoop out like the bottom of the barrel to get down. Yet like most of the escapes onto the next level seem to be, I know at least like in the first level, like he, he has to go all the way down to the bottom of something in order to escape to keep going somewhere. And I'm thinking like, wouldn't he just go back up? He would, he would want to go back up. <laughs> get back onto the street level but he doesn't I don't know do. it's weird <laughs> I think it's just like the simplicity of a map you know climb here crawl down this ladder crawl up this ladder blow up this trash can get this you know key crawl back down the ladder go back I, I think it's just like the repetitive motion of like you know just side scroll sky scroll crawl take out this bad guy over here back to the open door and it actually has a fairly catchy like soundtrack yeah. to go with it i mean like i mean it's it's the it's the nostalgic factor of like an 8 bit sound 8 bit soundtrack that just it fits it it doesn't necessarily have to actually like follow any type of uh familiar uh, familiarity with the movie itself but it fits i think it works out fine this is one of those games where one of the consoles clearly gets the better version in this case, it's the Super Nintendo one. Your sound is better. Your control is better. It's just somehow, in every way, the Super Nintendo version is better. And, of course, that's the one I don't have. <laughs> Back in the day, you know, the Super Nintendo version was getting, like, 7 out of 10 ratings, which, you know, that's not horrible. And the Genesis one was getting 5 or 6. Hmm. Genesis, it's not a system that I grew up with. I actually, like, man, we only had Nintendo products in my house growing up up until, I want to say, well, actually, you know what? We had Nintendo and Sony, like, side by side. But we never, we never had, like, a Sega Genesis in the house. Didn't have a Dreamcast or anything. I, th I think my game, uh, my game gear was the only thing that was like Sega oriented. And yeah, like we, uh, my we we did uh, get like an Xbox at one point, but that thing quickly got that red ring of death. And then after that, we were just like, no, nah, we're just gonna we're just gonna keep going Sony. Yeah, you know, like I had a Genesis growing up, but it was mostly Sonic the Hedgehog and sports games for me. And then, you know, my brother had whatever he wanted to play on it. So one thing the game does bring into it that wasn't in the movie is the dark judges. And that's just something I completely forgot to look at while I was doing research on the comic side of things. I'm trying to think of like, I'm trying to remember like who the dark judges were, because I remember, I remember like they actually wanted to bring in like judge death as the villain in the film, but it would have cost too much money to make his like skeletal body. So that's why they brought in Rico. I'm trying to remember what the dark judges actually did. Were they like the, the secret police of the judge force? Yeah. It looks like they were four law keepers from a parallel dimension. Ooh. Led by judge death, but there was also judges for fire, fear, and mortis. So, Judge Death had, like, his Horseman of the Apocalypse, essentially, with him? That's what it's looking like to me. I'm definitely going to have to look more that sounds, into this. Man, that's that's interesting. Okay. All right. Because I, I, I remember about Judge Death. I do not remember hearing about, like, the Dark Judges. How cool of a name is that? I dark know. Judges. I mean, I know that, like... Judge Death was a per was going to be like the villain that basically said like all living was illegal, so that's what he wanted just to do away with like Mega City, which it's weird in the movie that it's only around New York, but like Mega City is supposed to be like the entire like I think like the Pacific coastline. That makes a lot more sense with having him be in an Aspen prison colony too, right? And for the long walk, I totally get the idea that like 
Mega City is along uh, the coastline, or at least what would be near the coastline, because if the long walk is leading to a world that is completely void of any type of, you know, uh, eco-friendly environments or anything like that, so if, like, the oceans are partially even drying up, then by all means, the long walk will definitely take him through some deserts. So that can that can make sense, uh, you know, a lot. But yeah, no, that would actually have been that would have been neat, man. The dark judges. That would have been cool. Yeah, so I think the only other real cool things I saw about the game were that they were planning a version for the Atari Jaguar, and then that just never happened. Hmm. I always kind of wished I had a Jaguar, and then I look at the controller, and I'm glad I never did. <laughs> I was I was kind of the same way with um the the Dreamcast. I never liked the controller for the Dreamcast, and I always found it so weird that they like the game discs were mini discs. I found that so peculiar. They're not for a Dreamcast, though. Huh? Oh no! What, what am I thinking of then? GameCube. GameCube. Either way. Wait, are you but, saying you don't like the GameCube controller? Am I, am I going to get some hate mail? The only the only game I ever remember, and this is I'm going to be like very very honest with you, the only game I ever remember playing on a Dreamcast was Power Cube or Power Stone. See, that's a really good one though. No, no, no. It was super fun. It was super fun, but that was it. That's all I ever remember playing on it. But like the controller was weird to me. The controller is weird because it, because it was so different from either like a PlayStation controller or even at the time like I, I believe at the same time like was a like a Nintendo sixty four. So it was just it was just so different. But no, I agree. Power Stone was a fun. That was a fun game for that. See, now I wish I could have you come over and play Dreamcast. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife wishes that I would just give you a Dreamcast. <laughs> We can't win. <laughs> Let's just say there are multiple Dreamcasts in my house. <laughs> you know what? Just just tell her that when I come over, I'll take a Dreamcast home. And the only time that you'll have to play a Dreamcast is when I come back. I think she can live with that. I think. <laughs> I mean, she doesn't really have a choice. This is going to happen now. It's just going <laughs> to Is this a good deal? No? Hmm, too bad. <laughs> It's okay, Kaylee. We have more Dreamcast. You can still play it later. <laughs> Giving away one of the, uh, like, how many do you have? One of, like, six? Um, That actually might be right, because I have the one that's hooked up at the TV. I have a Japanese one, because I do have a few Japanese games. Mm. Even though you can make a boot disc and you don't need it. And then at least three or four more, just from wanting to grab them for parts and have them and available. And that's just smart to do because, I mean, if you can find them for cheap at, like, swap meets or even, like, a pawn shop or, hell, Goodwill. You know, and then you have way too much of your house filled up with that kind of thing. Filled up or very well stocked. <laughs> yes, let's go with very well stocked. Very well stocked. See, you got you to gotta sprinkle it with a little bit of sugar. You gotta gotta make it sound just right. <laughs> That's like when people come into my apartment. They're they they they'll walk in the door and they'll see right by the TV. I have like two massive bookshelves right there, and it's just full of DVDs and movies and like you know TV series. And they're like, oh, you know things, you know things come digital now, don't you? And I was like, what are you, what are you trying to say? <laughs> Leave my collection alone. <laughs> I like having physical copies. You paid three dollars to rent it, and I get to keep it for a dollar. Right? Oh my god, that's one of the like most beautiful things that I don't think like people understand. Where you you could either pay the three dollars to rent it and watch it, you could pay ten dollars maybe to get to own the digital copy, or I can go to the used bookstore, find a perfectly good copy as is, pay a buck fifty, and now I get to keep it forever. And it'll play on my PlayStation, my older PlayStation, old DVD players, Blu-ray players, if it need be. 
if you really need it digital, you can make your own digital copy. Right. And you know what? I'm just it's just gonna keep growing. They're gonna have to they're gonna have to deal. <laughs> Jumping back on topic a little bit, what do you think this game gets right? You know, at least when compared to the movie, because that's what it's based on after all. So compared to the movie, I mean you're you're gonna get the look and the feel of Mega City. It's it's definitely giving the size of Mega City. So, you know, climbing down ladders and going to lower layers of the city. I think that's pretty accurate because even as we had said, when Rob Schneider's being brought in by the taxi service, bringing in the other prisoners and taking him to the, uh, the heavenly Haven hotel where he's going to be staying, they're going down layers of the city where it's steadily getting worse. So the look and feel of the city, I think it's getting it right. It's, I think it's a little too bright, maybe not giving off like the idea that like, Hey, this is kind of like the slums maybe it should be a little darker but they're throwing in extra trash cans so it's going to look grungy which is fine we, you can blow them up with your grenades i think the ruthlessness of dread where it's either kicking them or shooting them in the face which i don't think i ever saw dread kick anybody in the movie if i remember correctly i don't think so <clears throat> but maybe just to flip him around so he can shoot him in the face instead of in the back right so i mean it's you're getting the ruthlessness of, of dread. Uh, his helmet always stays on. <laughs> and more importantly, you almost have this invincibility of dread because he has the massive health bar. He can take bullets from his enemies and steadily he'll get better. Just like in the, in like the first time that we see dread enter in, he's the backup that Hershey called and, you know, he's walking in the middle of the street and, you know, he's just like avoiding all of the uh, the fire, uh, the the firing from all the guns up above, and he he like he seems invincible. So I think it works out to the same idea that you know in the game, Dread can take a beating and he can still keep you know kicking ass and taking names. And I'm right there with you. You know, as much as you expect any kind of 16-bit game to follow a movie, it really does. I mean, it's it's definitely not going to be a substitute for watching the movie or anything but you definitely get a good feel of what's going to be going on. Right. And what do you think this game really gets wrong? I think the availability of so much replenishing, like, life support uh, for the movie, uh, the idea that ammo can be found randomly in dumpsters... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I know it's the, it's the basic formula of going around and like, you know, Link finding gems inside clay pots, but I think the availability of having replenishing ammo there and back and back and back, back to back, I, I think the idea that he even said the gun only holds 25 rounds, so... To have more than 25 rounds in the gun, or at least the option to continuously find more ammo, specifically meant for a lawmaker, <laughs> that's a little too convenient. But again, it's it's the basic, it's like the formulaic layout of a game. Yeah, I think the only thing really for me was that they brought the Dark Judges in there and... Like, if this was just a Judge Dredd game, that wouldn't have mattered. But the fact that it's a movie game and they're bringing in a giant end boss that has nothing to do with the movie. The only thing I could think of was that they started making the game before they decided that they just couldn't pull off Judge Death. But then they forgot to tell the people making the game that he wasn't going to be in there. <laughs> Or maybe this was the cheaper option that they were allowing. <laughs> we can't build him. Can we make him 8-bit? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that could definitely be it, too. But like, if that's what I'm having to pick out, as far as how it connects to the movie, I think it did a pretty decent job. Yeah, I mean, it's still, it's still a fun game from the playthroughs that I've seen. It looks it looks neat. I think it's giving you an overall. It, it's definitely giving you that like A to B 
storyline. I think the repetitiveness of constantly having to like go through the levels and almost do the exact same thing to try and get through it uh, could get a bit redundant. But as long as you have citizens to shoot and kick in the face and arrest and judge, I think you're going to be fine. And if you want to grab it, it's a really cheap game. I mean, under 10 bucks, no problem. Well, that's not bad. No, again, yeah, that's not going to break it. You know, that's not going to break the bank. Nobody's going to sit there and say, Ew, you have Judge Dredd. <laughs> I, I think anybody who actually would see a copy of Judge Dredd in your like game library would be all like, Oh my God, Judge Dredd, that's so cool. And then you offer them, you're like, You want to play it? And they're like, No. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much how it's been for me. <laughs> it's like, You own it? Yeah. Do you want to play it? I'm, I'm okay. But it's cool you have it, though. That's pretty neat. <laughs> uh, I wonder if even Stallone owned a copy of Judge Dredd. I want to say no, because he, he didn't even know who Judge Dredd was until he was offered the role for the film. Schneider looks like a person who would sit and play the Judge Dredd video game. Well, I mean, we did hear that Ed Unziata doesn't have a copy of Chalk and the Forever Man in him. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. So finally, if you've got somebody who wants to get into Judge Dredd, would you hand them this game as a little bit of a primer course? I would totally give them a, give them a copy of this. Yeah, because I think they can get a feel for what the movie is talking about. It's going to have, like I said, the same scrolling intro information, just not narrated by James Earl Jones. So they're going to know what Mega City is. They're going to have the familiar, uh, the, uh, familiar look of Dread walking around in his armor, shooting the lawmaker. Yeah, I think this would be a well, a well decided plan to uh, prep them for the for the cheese of uh, 1995 with Judge Dread. Yeah, I know a lot of people that just, for whatever reason, can't get into those 90s action movies unless it's one that they grew up watching. So this is the perfect thing to kind of hand to them, and if they react well, then you bring them to the movie. I think it's a good plan. It's a solid plan. Court adjourned. <laughs> so speaking of solid plans, if people want to hear more from you drew where can they find you around the internet oh gosh around the interwebs well uh you can always find myself nathan and jack on the real phil's podcast we uh we're out there basically wherever you could find podcasts anywhere on any podcatchers like itunes podbean stitcher anything like that just like google us you'll find us you can uh go find us up on twitter at real phil's pod and that's r-e-e-l like a film reel uh facebook instagram if you uh if you uh subscribe to us you can follow us we put out a new uh, episode every two weeks where we do a different movie genre every single time and if you are a big fan of uh, role-playing games i also run a dungeons and dragons live play podcast called crit storm cast and so that's myself, two other uh, podcasters, and then a husband and wife team who play along, uh, rolling and, you know, acting out their characters while I run a D&D game. And those are all, you know, really fun shows. I'm having, I'm having a good time. It's actually, I mean, Chris Stormcast, it's really nice because Thomas, who used to be on the Never Ending Minute podcast, he does all the editing for our actual play D and D show. I don't have to edit it. So that's actually a, I mean, that's a dream come true and he does a, a great job at it. I mean, that's so, probably the best part for you right there. It, it really is. That is probably the best part. <laughs> Some people are weird and like editing. I'm, I'm almost there. I, I enjoy editing our show for real feels. I really do because when it comes right down to it, like all the clips and sound bits and, you know, little music and stuff that I find to insert into our episodes, like this is me. I think it's funny 
or like it might even be spur of the moment where I find something and throw it in and I'm laughing my butt off at it. And then, you know, J- uh, Jack might come in and go like, I don't really get that reference. And I mean, I guess it's funny. And I'm like, uh-huh, <laughs> it's staying. You don't have a choice. <laughs> Well, thanks again for coming on. Um, if you want to find Play Comics Around Places, you can head on over to Twitter at Play Comics Cast or Facebook. You can find all those links either down in the show notes or over at playcomics.com, where you can also go see, you know, we have a merch store where you can go buy things and support us and get something out of it. Unless you want to just, Ooh. you know, straight up give us money. There's links for that, too. And if you want to hear me talk about Scooby-Doo with my wife, you can head on over to bendlingkidspod.com where, you know, spoiler alert, we talk about Scooby-Doo and go through the Scooby-Doo series. Head on over to soundcloud.com slash day where you can hear Best Day's music. But other than that, just grab a game, grab a stack of comics, and go find yourself a new favorite character. Jumping back on topic a little bit. I'm not sure how much of that will stay in, but I'm... <laughs> we'll see.